Well, thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lowen. I'm a, a Senior Director of Leadership Initiatives at the National Committee, and I'm delighted that we could be joined tonight uh, both by Dinda Elliott and Frank Upham. Uh, all three of us uh, spent time uh, in China in the spring of 1989. Uh, Dinda mentioned to me during the film that we probably know more about her and what was going on uh, than, than perhaps uh, we needed to. Uh, but, um, but we thought we would take about uh, a few minutes now to to talk about some of our thoughts about the film and our memories of the spring and maybe even bring this up uh, to date. You all should have the bios of Dinda and Frank uh, in front of you, so I'm not going to take uh, very much time right now going over that, but uh, everyone should know that Dinda was with Newsweek, a, a veteran journalist, Frank, a legal scholar uh, working at that point in, uh, in Wuhan at uh, Wuhan University. So, uh, and I was living in Beijing uh, as a, a fresh out of college and teaching at a small institute uh, just west of, of the square. So I thought maybe just to get us started, we could talk a little bit, to set the scene. So where, where we were in the spring of 89 and uh, kind of what our involvement was with the student demonstration. Frank, are you willing to start? Sure. Um, um, five minutes? Let's say three. Okay. Uh, I was in Wuhan, and I was there uh, ostensibly doing research uh, on consumer protection law. I have a background uh, in Chinese. I speak the language. Um, and I got there uh, May 20th, and uh, in the morning of May 21st, I was staying at the Chinese guest house, not the foreign guest house for various reasons. And I heard, I mean, obviously, two days before, the American government, the State Department had said that all Americans in China should leave and uh, that no Americans should go in. Uh, I went in anyway. Uh, and. Uh, so I knew that there were demonstrations in in Beijing. Uh, I heard dem I heard what turned out to be demonstrations. Uh, the next morning, I uh, went and I accompanied the demonstrations uh, from Wuhan University to the confluence of the rivers where there's that big eight eight-lane railroad and also uh, vehicular uh, bridge. And I didn't participate, I just uh, followed. I had actually been a journalist before, and I was just wanted to be an observer. And um, as far as I, there, there may of course been other foreigners, there were many other foreigners at Wuhan University for reasons that still escape me, both France and Japan had decided to make, put their cultural outreach centers in Wuhan. And so there were a lot of French and Japanese there, the artists, singers, and literature people. <clears throat> but when I would go down into the city, I never saw another Caucasian or African or, you know, they were all Asians. They obviously could have been uh, Koreans or, I would use or so on, but, um, and over the course of the next week, or I guess until the fourth, I <clears throat> would spend my time doing that during the day, talking to students, uh, talking to people I met as I was walking down. There was a fairly long walk. Wuhan at that time had not yet been opened. It was very pre-reformed. Um, and then, as in the movie, by Friday, I, uh, back then, it was wonderful to watch this and remember what it was like 25 years ago, you know. Back then, it was hard to make a phone call to the United States. Uh, 
But I got through on Friday to my wife, who was not pleased that I had decided to go into China, uh, and said, don't worry, uh, it's all over. Because there were no more demonstrations, it was just, it was over. And, uh, and I still don't understand, maybe it was the democracy statue, or so. I, I, it just seemed to me that the Communist Party snatched victory from, defeat from the jaws of victory. Uh, with the <coughs> incursion into the square. Um, but obviously, uh, uh, I and many other people were wrong. And so uh, on Sunday morning, I slept in, didn't get up to listen to the VOA and the BBC, as I had been doing the previous weeks. And uh, then I heard, again, a you know, large amount of noise. So I went down there, the students talked to me, and they said, you know, 40 people have been killed in the square, and I took that with a large grain of salt. In Wuhan uh, or in Beijing? Uh, in Beijing. Okay. Um, and to keep to the five minutes that Jonathan's three minutes really means, um, I then followed the students again. I actually went ahead of them, because they told me what the plan was. And there was a funeral march. Uh, and it was I'm trying to think whether my children's birth were more moving uh, than seeing this funeral march. I think not. Um, it was one of the most amazing scenes I've ever seen. Um, lots and lots of people, incredibly organized, moving very slowly with funeral music, black flags. Uh, across the bridge. I had gotten to the other side of the bridge up on a hill and they just came across just silent except for uh, the music which um, was astonishing and then you know it's incredibly depressing uh, but there was never any violence um, in Wuhan. There was a memorial service the next day uh, that almost became violent. Uh, there were supposedly 10,000 people there. Uh, it didn't become violent. <clears throat> the army never came into Wuhan. The French and the Japanese and other foreigners were absolutely terrified. And I mean, I'm using that advisedly. I mean, they were in terror that the PLA was going to come in go to the foreign dormitory, the foreign, you know, guest house, which was, of course, wonderful, uh, and slaughter them all in their beds. Um, I knew that wouldn't happen, but it was hard for me to persuade them of that. Um, and then I was determined to stay because I thought now is when it's going to get interesting. Um, but it didn't get interesting. It just got deeply deeply depressing, mm -hmm. just utterly depressing. So, I left. Jinda, we know that... that you know, yeah, so, sorry about the you know, personal story though. That was, I was not expecting Mike to, Mike to include that in the film. But um, I guess what I would do is just set the stage a little bit for what, you know, what it felt like at that time and in the kind of months before um, the student movement. You know, it's hard to, you can't really exaggerate just how idealistic, um, you know, a time it was in, in China. Um, I mean, you guys were there, you remember it well, but, you know, it was a time of incredible intellectual exploration. And we as journalists, and especially the ones of us who spoke Chinese, and, you know, not that I could sneak around not being noticed with blonde hair, but, but I would literally go see intellectuals, you know, who the head of the Marxism Socialism Institute, who was ex exploring the sort of um, possibilities of democracy within, you know, he was the head of that institution, but he was exploring that. I would go visit him. He lived in the People's Daily Compound, and I'd go visit him at night, mm -hmm. trying to crawl around, not be noticed. And I'm sure I was noticed, but anyway, you know. And and as I mentioned in the film, there were these meetings that would happen among these kind of cutting edge liberal intellectuals who were really testing the limits of what. China might become. You know, China had just been through the Cultural Revolution. Everybody in China felt like 
it's been a terrible time. We have to throw that away and find something new and kind of how can we make China a better country? So there's all kinds of exploration going. And these, some of these intellectuals would warn me and kind of say, you have to understand this is, this is something very dangerous is happening here. I don't think any of us journalists really appreciated just how dangerous it was. And then just jumping fast forward to the student movement itself, you know, as I mentioned, the grannies throwing milk at me, et cetera. You know, we all, I think we all misunderstood um, that just how, you know, misunderstood understood the idea that it was going to end in bloodshed and tragedy, um, partly because the Chinese themselves let go of their disbelief. I mean, it was that moment when, you know, you're March, May 4th and you're marching, there are 100,000 people on the streets, and it's not just students, it's these old timers who have lived through the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution and the anti-rightist movement and all these things, and yet they have suspended their disbelief and kind of are joining in. And you can't help but think, well, they know this place better than I do. And they're sort of believing that something that might have a happy ending. And then just to add one other final note, um, you know, the Chinese newspapers, I guess, around in the end of April, suddenly the People's Daily had incredibly positive coverage of the student movement. I mean, all the official press was covering because what we didn't, un we understood a little bit, but didn't really understand that the student movement was kind of a sideshow. That what was really happening was a power struggle at the highest level. And the head of the Communist Party, the head of the Communist Party, Zhao Ziyang, had put out the word to the papers that it was okay to cover this, that this was actually being, you know, kind of officially sanctioned by the party. So, you know, it was very easy to kind of get it wrong. And, uh, you know, was, there was that fateful, um, editorial that Dan Sutherland men mentioned, which was clearly coming straight from the, the mouth of Deng Xiaoping, where you know he called them counter-revolutionaries and said it was chaos and there had to be it had to end. And um, you know at that point we should have all known that it was going to have have a very sad ending. Um, so I, I think for me what what uh, the film reminded me of so much was the roller coaster that that that, that April, May, and June were. So that. Um, this notion that the goddess of democracy was the, that may have been the, the, the peak of the political theater, but the students uh, seem to have a very good sense of when the movement was starting to lose its energy, so that it, when, it, when it needed to get uh, some sort of a re-injection, so that uh, there was great energy to mourn Hu Yaobang. Um, as things started to wane, the hunger strike came in and, and uh, re-energized it. Uh, martial law, which was supposed to tamp down the entire movement, instead galvanized, I think, uh, the city. Uh, my, my colleagues and friends said, John, you know, we are going to stay out in the street tonight. Come on with us. And so we, you know, I stood on the, the streets right near Mushudi waiting for the uh, PLA to come in because the People's Army does not hurt the people, and that's what all of my friends had told me. Um, uh, and then even when martial law was uh, kind of uh, more in force, uh, the streams of people going out to uh, Liu Lichao to meet with the troops in their trucks and explain what was happening in the city. Uh, again, it, it kind of took this energy that, that had uh, been, been flagging and re-energized it. And then, uh, as we heard in the film, uh, the goddess of democracy getting erected in the square, getting the, the pieces which, which couldn't be brought to the square by any kind of uh, uh, vehicle, any kind of um, gas-powered vehicle, you know, assembled in four huge pieces, thrown on the back of a pedicab, um, after it was made known that it would be illegal for anyone to drive it in, uh, the height of, of political theater. And it, it, it just always amazed me that, uh, just in terms of where the students derived these lessons and how much of it was, was, uh, was luck, how much of it was the government, uh, in a way, being their own worst enemy. But, uh, those were some of my thoughts. Um, can we, uh, I, want, I do want to open things up for audience questions, and maybe we should, we've got about uh, 12 minutes left, maybe it's the time 
time to do that if, if there are some. In the I'd love to talk about the present. If anybody has, especially if people have questions about how this resonates today, I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? We were well, getting a second. Just a, a quick thought, because it just I, so happens I've just come back from, I spent a month in China, just, uh, just got back two days ago. And, um, you know, it feels, when you're in China, it almost feels like you're going through the looking glass, uh, like Alice in Wonderland. Um, because the government has been so successful in kind of using propaganda um, effectively to, you know, right after the, the crackdown, the government started, well, firstly, I guess it started really a couple years years later when Deng Xiaoping launched his very, um, you know, aggressive and forceful economic reforms and basically said to people, you can get rich, but just keep your hands out of politics. So that was kind of, I feel like that was kind of the Chinese people making a, a deal with the devil in a way. Mm -hmm. um, that, and that everybody in China is part of that deal because things have gotten so much better. I mean, everybody is so much richer. Their lives are so much freer and richer in so many ways. Um, but it is this kind of deal where you have to keep your mouth shut. So a couple of just examples of how it feels like going through the looking glass. Um, you know, that tank man picture, just for example, a month or so ago, there was a symposium about June 4th at Harvard, which I participated in. And um, some people found, and not too long ago, I guess a year ago or so, they brought a guy out of China who survived. His legs were crushed by, by a tank that night. And he had been um, a student at the, the um, what was it called? The, 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 um, it was the, the sports university. So, and he's still this kind of strapping guy. He's in a wheelchair, because he's, you know, has no legs, but he's still this strapping, uh, almost like a socialist realist character. And his legs were crushed. Um, and there are photographs of him, you know, flying in the street with his legs crushed. Mm -hmm. And he went to the hospital. Um, he, you know, somebody took him to the hospital that night. And then he woke up probably days later, whatever. And he was visited in the hospital by people who said to him, who used that photograph and said, it's not possible that you were crushed by a tank because you see the People's Liberation Army would never roll over someone in a tank. And so they used that for 20 years. They used that photograph against him. And it was for him very moving to kind of, you know, we were discussing this photograph and he, you know, they used it in the completely opposite way. And, and you know, the Chinese government immediately started saying that the West is trying to keep us poor. Um, you know, anybody who's kind of, you know, trying to support any democracy movement, it's just because they're trying to keep us down in China. And so that's been a very, very effective, um, I think, strategy on the part of China. And, you know, these days, people, young people, firstly, I was there for the 25th anniversary of June 4th, and of course nothing happened except for 180,000 people in Hong Kong who came out to, um, you know, commemorate it. But, um, you know, young people don't know about Tiananmen. I mean, this is just the weirdest thing, is that they literally don't know that this stuff happened. And so it's, it's just, there's this sort of big lie that kind of, you know, is, is kind of, I feel, is in a way all around you in many ways. But anyway, so it's just, just a thought. Are there questions in the audience? Or I have a question over here. How can we develop a politics I believe the idea of engaging in our God and each other constructively in a new UN renewal, which I had worked on, a new spirituality, actually, in our politics, uh, to spend our time more constructively. How can we go about doing that? <laughs> I mean, I, I will just say, on the as someone who works for the National Committee, I think that we're trying to build more bridges here, and we're not advising government in terms of, of uh, specific human rights policy, but we do have dialogues about it and trying to bring people to the table to discuss some very sensitive issues. So, uh, Security Council isn't really working. Nothing. We're approaching this in terms of the bilateral relationships that we can. I would say that I would just add that I think you know it has to be about engagement because if there's one thing that drives China um, is the the idea of Fu becoming powerful and wealthy, 
and China, I think, is still struggling with the kind of 150 years of humiliation when foreigner, foreigners came in and took over their cities, etc. And um, you know, so there's this obsessive um, need to be treated as equal, and I think that you know, I think engagement is the only way to address that. I work with a group called the. We have tweets. We have, we have other questions. We'll go here and then. Um, my name is Marcia Wagner. This film was really well edited and very, very concise and um, so much complexity was made so lucid. I'm wondering how our friends who aren't here can see it. How is it going to be distributed? Or so I would say two things. Uh, and first of all, as much as any of us would love to take credit for the, for the making of the film, we're not involved with that. Uh, Mike Chinoy out at USC uh, uh, pulled it together. Uh, he has made it available online both on the USC website and on YouTube. So anyone who has access to those sites uh, is able to watch it in its entirety. And we should say it's part of a whole series that Mike has done on various generations of Western in China. There's a wonderful film on how the Nixon trip was covered by American journalists, how it was managed both by the White House and by the Chinese. And he has the, the first generation of Western journalists in China and very generously has made these all available. The better seen it on a big screen, which you can watch it on all the money. I think we have one more question right up front. Thank you very much, Valerie Stern, the uh, US China. People's Friendship Association. I'd like to know, please, how is how are these events um, reflected in textbooks and the historical record that is presented to students? To Chinese or in China? They yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's not. They're not. They're not. They're, uh, I would just say one thing um, as some of you may know, uh, New York University, where I teach, has uh, opened a four-year university in Shanghai. And I was talking to one of the uh, approximately half Chinese students and half not non-Chinese students. And um, I was talking to one of the professors about the reaction to various things that are presented in the classroom. And the students, uh, the Chinese students will, will just say, well, that's wrong. I mean, the, you know, that the world is flat. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, Linda got it right when she said there's a kind of uh, a, a universal agreement that we're just going to get rich first. Uh, but there's also, uh, the agreement is facilitated by extraordinarily uh, good socialization. I should say, the mm -hmm. Americans are socialized as well. Uh, our government has civics classes in high schools, and so this is not something which only the Chinese government does. The Chinese government does it very well. Um, you know, how long they will, and another thing that struck me about about the, I remember walking down uh, student housing uh, in Wuhan University and listening, going from room to room, listening to the VOA and the BBC in both Chinese and English. And then watching this with the CNN um, reporting and Richard Roth and all this stuff and thinking, you know, we live in a time when we think the internet is this all-powerful device. And yet, I don't think you could get coverage like this of maybe any authoritarian place, Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, Honduras. Uh, and there was no internet. And yet, you had incredible openness. And I don't, I mean, I, I just thought about, this is the second time I've seen the film, I just thought about that, why, why? I mean. I think in some way it's extremely open if you want to, you know, watch cat videos, uh, which I've been known to do. But, uh, but 
I'm not sure the internet is necessarily, what if this is nothing to do with China necessarily, but has, it's quite the, the magic key that we have sort of, or at least I have thought it was up until. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to add two things about history and China's inability or unwillingness to deal with its history. One, one of the reasons I was in China just now is I was taking a group of Stony Brook um, journalism students around for three weeks. And we were hosted by the Chinese University of Communications, which I discovered is the former broadcast university. So this is the place that basically churns out uh, the broadcast journalists who are going to be on CCTV, Chinese Central Television. And it's, it, as it so happens, it's, I quickly discovered it's a very, very political, politically correct um, university. Maybe all universities are these days. I don't have a whole lot of experience on Chinese universities. But one night, um, we were having dinner with our students, 12 of our students. But CUC had provided a couple of students to be our kind of, you know, to be interpreters for the kids and kind of be our guides and stuff. And they were at the dinner. And we had decided, my fellow professor and I had decided that we were going to talk to the kids about history. Because the kids, as they first arrived from Long Island, they were saying, man, Beijing looks like, you know, New York. And, you know, I felt like we need to kind of fill them in on what's really going on here. There's a kind of multi-layered, multi-faceted thing going on. So over dinner, we decided, even though these two Chinese kids were going to be at the dinner, we just decided to kind of do it anyway. And so we had a talk where we were talking about, you know, basically went back to 1949, talked about the revolution, talked about the anti rightist movement, talked about, you know, Great Leap Forward and 30 million people starving, and then talked about the Cultural Revolution, and when ended up with Tiananmen, you know, and the stu our kids were kind of, their eyes were like, oh my God, you know, they didn't know about all this stuff. The next day, the Chinese kids' professor, called us and was absolutely enraged. She said that her students had been traumatized, that we had hurt the feelings of the Chinese people, um, and you know, why are we constantly focusing on negative things from the past? Why can't we just let it go? Why are we looking in the past? And so the other thing I just wanted to add is I also was there, I had the very good fortune of, um, I had the opportunity to inter interview Ai Weiwei, who's an artist um, who has a show, a wonderful show at the Brooklyn museum right now, and I asked him, uh, you know, what do you think about China's inability to deal with history, and is it going to hold the country back? And I just wanted to read this very short thing from him, because he's he was speaking in English, and his English is not perfect, but he's very, very articulate, and I thought what he said was quite fascinating and, and poignant. Um, he says, it's very difficult to progress and improve if society can't learn from the past, for society not to be conscious. They should understand that to announce those mistakes, it's not a loss of face. You don't have to bear that responsibility as long as you consciously understand that a mistake, it was a mistake. Everybody can, fall, fa can fail, but it's very strange if after you fall, you try to glorify that gesture and just sit there and not move. I think the government is lacking a profound understanding of how to make a nation move forward. They're sacrificing the human conscience or intelligence for the small mistakes somebody made along the way. They really under, underestimate the whole society's ability to adjust themselves and to learn from their mistakes. Wow. That's pretty mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. Uh, I've taught a couple of semesters at uh, Tsinghua, which is one of the universities in Beijing. And, um, Leading, like the MIT. Yes, like the MIT, although I taught as if, as if MIT started a law school. Um, I was in the law school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I would elaborate on what you said. Um, it, it's a, the first day, I teach a course called Law and Development, about law and development. Good <laughs> enough. Um, and, uh, the first class, I asked the students to define law and development. Um, and one of the students started to talking about uh, law and uh, equating law to the rule of law and that you could only have rule of law if you had competitive democracy and uh, so on and so forth. And I was you know, conducting the class sort of half in Chinese and half in English. Um, and I, uh, I didn't see my role there as providing a chance for my students to get themselves in trouble. I, I didn't, I, you know, I, so I went to the dean. 
uh, who, who's lived through all this history and who's a wonderful uh, guy, now teaching for us in Shanghai. And I said to him, um, I, I, you know, I, I'm not going to tell people, I mean, we're going to talk about whatever they want to talk about, and I'm going to talk about the same, exactly the same things I say in New York. But I don't, I don't want students to get in, to see this as some safe place that they can. And he laughed and he said, they can say anything they want in class. They just can't organize four people to change the parietal hours in the dormitory. <laughs> uh, so I found that everything was, was very open in class, but it had this ground norm of ignorance. So they could talk about the rule of law, which is sort of like talking about mother's love. I mean, who the, what the hell is it? <laughs> uh, and um, it's, but, and so they could talk about fundamental political change in China, but they had no depth of historical understanding of what had happened they, in, in China, um, which may be the most effective way to control your people. Let them yeah. talk about whatever they want. Right. As long as they don't publish it, as long as they don't organize, um, just don't let them know what really happened. <laughs> Maybe we should try to do that. I guess I would just say as a, an interesting postscript on that, it, it is interesting to see as the numbers of Chinese students studying overseas continues to increase. We're, we're well over, I mean, in the U.S. alone, high school, college, universities, uh, probably hovering around 300,000 now. Uh, that's in the U.S. alone. It's probably another 300,000 in Australia, Hong Kong, the U.K., Canada. Uh, I mentioned Australia. So, and that, no, those numbers are growing. And it'll be interesting to see how that changes as you have some of China's best and, and brightest getting exposed to information that they haven't uh, been exposed to before, and how that changes this conversation. So, Jonathan wants to wrap this up, but I'm going to say one more thing. Uh, I taught for two years in Taiwan. And some of you may know the Nationalist Party was organized with help from the Soviet Union. It's a Leninist party. Uh, when I was in Taiwan, there was no freedom. There was, there was less freedom of expression than there was when I've been teaching in Beijing. Um, and yet, uh, and a lot of students came from Taiwan, and they came here, and they went back. And uh, lots of the time when I was in, in, in after the crackdown, uh, in, in, in uh, Tiananmen, I was thinking about Taiwan, which was at that point just sort of accelerating its democratization. So I would be, um, end on an optimist view, I would be with, uh, was it Passon, the guy? Yeah, yeah. Passing, yeah. So who says, he gets the call, yeah, he, yeah. and he says, don't, don't be discouraged. Be and so, uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you all very much for coming. Thanks in particular to Mark Harrison. And we look forward to seeing you at upcoming 